This is a podcast from BFM 89.9, The Business Station. Welcome back. You're listening to The Morning Run with Philip C. and I'm Wong Shaoning. It is 8.36. It's Friday and of course it's the 12th of April. In a half an hour, we have the opening bell where we check out how Bursa Malaysia begins the trading day. But before that, let's talk about Sarawak politics because talk that Party Sarawak Bersatu, otherwise known as PSB, and Progressive Democratic Party, PDP, would merge, start percolating way back in July 2023. PSB, an opposition party, is led by Datuk Sri Wong Su Ko. Sun Ko has reportedly 80,000 members and three assemblymen. Meanwhile, PDP is a member of the ruling Gabungan Party Sarawak GPS, which has five assemblymen and two MPs, and is led by Datu Sri Tiong King Singh, who is the Minister of Tourism. The biggest open secret in Sarawak politics was subsequently announced last weekend when the dissolution approval of PSB by the Registrar of Society cited, with the PSB members have been accepted en bloc into PDP. So how does this change the politics within Sarawak? For answers, we turn to Dr. James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania. Good morning, James. Always good to speak to you. Now, as we said earlier on, PSB leaders and members, once an opposition party, have now joined PDP, which is, of course, one of the component parties within GPS. Let me guess, this move wasn't a surprise, but what are the factors behind it? Uh, Good morning. So you're absolutely right. Uh, This was not a surprise. In fact, the rumour goes back as far as 2021, after the state election, many people were already predicting that Wong Sung Ko and PSB will try to find a route back into the GPS, the ruling coalition. So let me give you a bit of background. So Wong Sung Ko was a long-serving state minister in Sarawak, and he was a very senior figure in the Sarawak United People's Party. Uh, there was a leadership tussle. So he left the party and formed a new party called PSB. Uh, The idea behind PSB was that in the 2021 state election, PSB was supposed to do very well. In other words, win somewhere between 20 to 30 seats. And that will give them an open invitation to go back to GPS as the one of the new component parties. But of course, that didn't happen. They only won four seats. And uh, GPS won 76 out of 82 seats. So suddenly they found that they became a mosquito party within the larger Sarawak picture. And people always understood that, you know, it was no longer possible for Sunko to go back as an independent or new component party. So the only way he could go back into GPS was basically to join one of the four existing GPS component parties. But unfortunately, three of them uh, was not possible. And the only one that was possible was PDP under Tiong, who is the current Minister of Tourism. So basically, they hatched a deal where PSB will be dissolved and their members will join PDP as an enlarged PDP. So that's where we are today. So how does this change the party dynamics of the PDP, right, with their position with, with GPS versus other member parties like Parti, Prasaka, Bumi Putra, Bersatu and Sarawak, Sarawak United People's Party? So uh, basically, it doesn't change the existing uh, structure. So even with the inclusion of the three uh, new YBs into PDP, uh, the total number of state YBs will remain eight. Uh, there will still be the smallest uh, in terms of elected representative among the four GPS parties, but it means a significant shift in diet politics. This means that uh, there's basically uh, very few diet opposition seats left because most of the diet seats are now with GPS under PBB, PRS, Party Right, Sarawak, and PDP. Uh, the second big uh, political significance is that basically there's no more opposition mm-hmm. in Sarawak. The opposition Sarawak out of 82 seats, only two are from the DAP. So it's basically an urban Chinese thing in terms of opposition. Uh, all the other seats, as I mentioned, are with GPS. So basically, we're back to square one, like in the early 70s, when the old Sarawak Barisan National dominated Sarawak politics to such an extent that basically there was no opposition. So we've sort of turned our clock back. So the bottom line is that there's no real opposition in Sarawak. The only formal opposition consists of two seats from the Democratic Action Party. Which is exactly my next question, James. Why does GPF have such a grip on the state? And what does it say then about opposition in Sarawak, that it, it cannot survive? 
uh, it doesn't mean that the opposition cannot survive. It simply means that the GPS has been uh, pursuing a lot of populist policy. But more importantly, mm. I think from 2016 onwards, uh, they c- caught on to this thing called Sarat nationalism. So there's this very strong uh, thing about uh, Sarat being different from the rest of the federation and that we want to keep Sarat politics local. So you can see, right, the tagline for GPS is Sarat first. Uh, essentially, it means Sarat for the Sarakians. And if you look at all the GPS parties, uh, all of them basically concentrate their political activities on Sarawak only. So you won't find any uh, YB for any of the four component parties uh, representing non Sarawak seats. Uh, so they're all based in Sarawak. So it is really about the rise of Sarawak nationalism uh, more than anything else. Yeah, so Sarawak first, Sarawak nationalism. What does this mean and say about the state as part of the overall federation in Malaysia? Do you think that there will be eventual talks about cessation even? Or is that just a step too far? Um, I don't think among the, the, the political elites, I don't think succession is on the table now. I think what they're trying to do is what we might call state within a state. So Surah is trying to build all the institutions of state. As you know, they're in the process of acquiring a bank. Mm-hmm. They set up their own development bank uh, two years ago. They set up Petros, their own state company, oil state company two years ago. And they're also in the process of acquiring their own airline, which will happen probably end of the year. And they're trying to get education and health autonomy. So these are all very important uh, uh, what they call roles played by uh, a state. Uh, if you are a state, state within a state, you want to build up all these key institutions. So I think that's where they're heading uh, rather than succession. I think succession at the present moment is really a road that uh, can't be taken right now. And James, this is only possible because they are kingmakers when it comes to forming a government, isn't it? Uh, yes, but I won't call them a kingmaker. I would call them a creme de la creme. They are the one that ensures that the government uh, is stable. So if you look at the formation of the uh, uh, Anwar Ibrahim government in, in 2022, right? The kingmaker then was actually Amno. Amno was the one that swing the 36 that allowed them to form the government. When GPS and the rest came in with the Sabahans, right, they gave Anwar the two-thirds majority. Uh, so I won't say they are the kingmakers, but yes, uh, they are a very important block and you really cannot have a stable federal government without support from GPS and the Sabahans. So yes, they're very important and they, are, they know that mm. and they're going to leverage it to, to get maximum authority from the federal government. But there's no guarantee that their support will continue at GE16, right, with this PH government? Uh, I would suggest that uh, at the next state election, which is due in, in two years' time, uh, they'll probably perform even better. Mm. And the reason for that is very simple. is because of the mess we're seeing on the peninsula side with all this toxic uh, race and racial politics. So people in Sarawak has doubled down on Sarawak nationalism, saying that uh, we do not want to follow the same style of politics we have mm. in peninsula Malaysia. In, in Sarawak, while things are not, uh, 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 you know, are, are not perfect, they are a hell lot better compared to the sort of toxic politics uh, that we see in peninsula Malaysia. It's interesting you call them the creme de la creme because many, I think, in peninsula would consider them a voice of reason and rationale, especially on their stance on issues like the KK Mart firebombing in Kuching, right? So do you think then Sarawak's influence in Peninsula and the broader Malaysia can be net positive, actually? Uh, so the answer is that there is a, a, a lot of people in, in Peninsula, Malaysia. In fact, there was an article written a few days ago saying that perhaps the the, the uh, Malayan political class should look towards Sabah Sarawak for political leadership. Unfortunately, I have some bad news for your listeners. The political leaders in Sarawak are not interested in taking over leadership <laughs> of Malaysia. <laughs> For obvious reasons, uh, they think that it's just too toxic. There is just uh, no solution. So they rather build up uh, their own societies and keep it at a local level. I think it's really important uh, what they're doing. Uh, they're just trying to make sure that the sort of toxic politics that we find in Malaya uh, is not replicated in Sarawak. So that's the reason why many people, including myself, were also really shocked that the third attempted fire bombing happened in Kuching. Mm. And looking at MA63, our Deputy Prime Minister 
Uh, Datuk Sri Fadila Yusof said that nine demands concerning it have been fully resolved to date, but there are still 14 to go. How challenging will it be for these outstanding demands to be met before GE16? And which are the ones you think are most complex? Uh, look, there are certain demands that the people of Sabah Sarawak want in regards to MS63 uh, that can never be resolved. So, for example, they want to uh, null and void the PDA 74. They want to take back the oil rights. I don't think that's possible. I don't think it's possible to repeal uh, PDA 74. The reason is very simple. Because if you repeal PDA 74, it means that for the last uh, 50 years, Petronas does not exist legally anymore. So it is uh, really uh, not possible to do that. I think what they're hoping to do is uh, maximum autonomy. So the two big items they have to resolve is basically uh, health uh, autonomy and education autonomy. I'm sure many of your listeners know that uh, the biggest budget items is actually education and education education is a huge problem in Malaysia. Mm. Uh, despite what everyone says, we all know that standards are dropping. Uh, even the normal middle class family, lower middle class family, if they can afford it, they want to send their children to, to private schools. Uh, those who can't afford it will send their children to the Chinese schools. So everyone knows standards are dropping. So in terms of education autonomy, in terms of Sabah and Sarawak, the thinking is that we want to bring back English as the as uh, the core medium of education together with BASA. So in terms of Sarawak, they're actually pushing or they're in the process of building six international schools using the British GCO all levels and air levels as the as the curriculum. So everybody in Sabah and Sarawak understands that uh, uh, English is, is actually the way to go. Mm. And they know that uh, this thing can never happen if they don't get education autonomy. Because in, in, in Malaya, right, the moment you mentioned that we want to go back to English, uh, a lot of the Malay nationalist groups would uh, essentially go crazy. But you don't find that situation in Sabah and Sarawak. People over there understand that, yes, Bahasa Melayu is the national language, but to survive in the 21st century, you really need English. And we know that, you know, for the first 10, 15 years after independence, a lot of students went to the English uh, stream, and that doesn't make them any less Malaysian. Mm. All right. Thank you very much for your time. That was Dr. James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania, helping us unpack what's happening in the state of Sarawak and why they're pushing for more autonomy. And interestingly, education is a priority for that state, right? With them mm, wanting more English. And yeah. they can. And right? they can afford because and leverage power. As James said, they're not kingmakers. They're creme de la creme. <laughs> Up next, we'll be discussing the boycotts of businesses and how it's affecting the country. Stay tuned. BFM 89.9. You have been listening to a podcast from BFM 89.9, The Business Station. For more stories of the same kind, download the BFM app.